Hello and welcome to the Patterson Gimlin footage, Real vs. Real. Recently I uploaded my hashtag Ask Ben video where I answered your burning questions and one of those inquiries encouraged me to make this entry. Not only that, but in the comment section of that upload, so many of you requested that this video be made that I had no other choice. So in this special edition of my Real vs. Real series, we will be looking quite closely at the hotly debated Patterson Gimlin footage. I know many of you may be thinking, how can this be a real versus real when he pretty much said he believes it is real in his last video? Well, this is a film of a cryptid, so it fits with the series, and I think the conclusion at the end may result in a, well, uh, let's just say watch the video until the end. The Patterson-Gimlin footage of a Bigfoot now lovingly referred to as Patty is one of quite debate. Both sides of the conversation provide valid and thought-provoking arguments to their defense, but let's see if we can gain any further insight. What many people consider is the holy grail of Bigfoot footage, we find in a short film which was recorded on October 20th in 1967. Two men named Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin set out to Six Rivers National Forest in Del Norte County of California with the sole purpose of trying to capture proof of a Sasquatch. As a note, I have seen the area pronounced both as Del Norte and Del Norte, so anyone from the area, please help me out with this. Roger had decided they needed to specifically investigate an area near the Bluff Creek, as recent sightings and footprints had been found there in 1958 and up until a few months before his encounter. Gimlin was known to be a skeptic in the idea of a Bigfoot-like creature existing, but he went on the trip in order to support his friend. The two men rode into the area on horseback and carried enough provisions for a couple day trip. Both men agreed that if they should encounter the elusive creature, it would be prudent not to shoot it, but they did pack rifles for their trip. Around 1 or 2 o'clock p.m., the men were riding along Bluff Creek when they came to an overturned tree, and when they made their way around it, they came upon a discovery that would forever change their lives. According to their reports, they saw a hairy bipedal creature knelt down along the bank. They reportedly got as close as 25 feet from the creature before it stood up and started to walk away from them. The height varied between the two men, with Roger saying it was near 7 feet tall, whereas Robert stated it wasn't much over 6 feet. At the sight of the being, Patterson's horse reared up and quickly took off once Roger left the saddle. Patterson yelled for Gimlin to cover him as he followed the hairy beast, and Robert took his horse across the creek, keeping the Bigfoot between him and his partner. Gimlin did grab his gun at Patterson's request, but he stated he never aimed it at the Sasquatch. According to Roger, Patty turned to look at him two times before he started recording, much in the same way that she did famously when captured on film. He later would describe the creature's facial expression as looking like it was disgusted with their presence. Once Patty walked into a tree line, Gimlin followed it for 300 more yards before losing it in a bend in the road that he was traveling on. The men regrouped and followed Patty's tracks for a few more miles until they vanished into some heavy underbrush. They returned to camp and grabbed plaster to make castings of the footprints left behind. Not long after this, the two made their way into town, and Patterson made his way to Eureka in order to ship his film to his brother-in-law, Al Diatli. During this time, they met up with a man named Al Hodgson and asked him to contact a scientist by the name of Donald Abbott as he had shown interest in the existence of Bigfoot. Patterson was hoping that after Donald received a call, he would immediately come down and help the men track Patty with hunting dogs. The call was made, but strangely, Mr. Abbott refused to come down. The two men decided to return to their camp to check on their cast that they had made, but stopped by a ranger station to tell them what they had encountered, as well as contacting the Times Standard newspaper from Eureka to relay their story as well. Once they finally made it back to camp, it began raining so hard that Patterson decided to end their further investigations, and the two went back home. After these events, Patterson took his now-developed film and brought it to scientific outlets, assuming that they would be interested in it due to it showing proof of a Sasquatch being real. Strangely, most scientists were not interested in seeing the film. Not long after this, Patterson made a deal with the BBC to utilize parts of his footage for the purposes of producing a docudrama about their encounter. It is worth noting that outside of rare instances, Bob Gimlin intentionally stayed out of the limelight. 
This is something I want to touch on later. Sadly, Roger died of Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1971, but before his death he was very active in his discussions about the film until his dying day never relented on it being legitimate. Before getting down to brass tacks, I do want to mention something very important about Roger Patterson. Roger had an intense interest in the being after he read an article about Bigfoot by Ivan T. Sanderson in True Magazine in 1959. Later, Ivan would also publish a book entitled Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, where it contained multiple reports of sightings in the very same location Patterson decided to hunt for his Bigfoot in Bluff Creek. Roger became so infatuated with the idea of Bigfoot that he even self-published his own book called Do Abominable Snowman of America Really Exist? in 1966. Going a step farther, in the early months of 1967, Roger began shooting a film relating loosely to the events of Ape Canyon, an event we have talked a lot about recently from Mount St. Helens. But I'll get to that shortly. The first thing that I want to touch on is the fact that many people are quick to point out that Robert Gimlin seemed to avoid the limelight, which many assumed to mean he knew something. In rare interviews with him, he touched on this topic and stated his wife urged him to stay out of it for fear of popularity changing their life. Later on, he would still refuse to talk about it due to not being paid by all the events and movie deals that the film was being represented in. This is about all there is for him in this story, except for one interesting counterpoint I realized, which I will mention near the end. For the most part, critics took a back seat about this footage, but it was brought before many greats in the costume and special effects industry. Their opinions ranged from authentic to it being a terrible looking gorilla costume. It seemed even in that industry, this film had caused quite a rift in opinions. On January 30th in 1999, a man named Bob Hieronymus stepped forward claiming that he was the man in the paddy suit, although he sat on telling his story until the right offer was given to tell it. In his claims, he kept quiet for so long due to him hoping to be paid for his work, and when he realized it wasn't going to happen, he broke his silence. With his tell-all, which was published in a book called The Making of Bigfoot by Greg Long, he provided accounts by a family and friends who stated they saw the gorilla suit in his car days after filming. I am going to come back to him, but we have someone else tied to this. In 2002, a man named Philip Morris, no, not the tobacco company, claimed he made the suit used in the film at the request of Patterson for a prank. However, in 2004, a suit was recreated to compare it to the one in the footage, but it was said to not even come close. Morris later refused to release the video of the suit's creation, and further stated he was too busy to remake it himself. To date, he has yet to offer up a suit even similar to one he claims to have made originally. Very suspicious, if I do say so myself. Now, this is why I held off on talking more about Bob Hieronymus's claim. Bob and Philip have worked together to get their claims acknowledged, but they can't agree at all on how the suit was made. Bob says it was a three-piece, head, shirt, and pants, and Philip says it was a one-piece with a zipper in the back. Bob says it was heavy, made of horse hair, and stunk. Philip says it was lightweight, made of a synthetic fabric called Dynel, and was odorless. Bob says the hands and feet were sewed on, but Philip says they were separate. It really sounds like these two are talking about two different suits. Here is something that is rarely brought up about Mr. Hieronymus. He was an actor in Patterson's film about Ape Canyon. Before the footage of Patty, Roger Patterson was making a film about cowboys retelling their stories of Bigfoot encounters akin to the famous Ape Canyon event. With that film, Patterson did purchase a Bigfoot costume and take a guess as to who was portraying the creature. You guessed it, Bob Hieronymus. I can't help but wonder if this is why there is so much confusion. This isn't the end of the story for Bob, however, as he came forward and stated that Patterson had rented their horses off of him the day the footage was shot. Going farther, he stated specifically that Roger rented a horse named Chico for Gimlin as he didn't have a proper horse to use. In this confession, he says Chico was a mature horse that wouldn't have bucked and gotten startled like it did in the story. 
The issue is that nowhere in the retellings did Gimlin's horse get startled. It was Patterson's who wanted to run away. Just thought you might find that interesting. Taking a look at the film, as mentioned in my hashtag AskBen video, the creature on camera doesn't appear to be a man in a suit. There isn't any floppy skin or wrinkles like fabric commonly likes to do, and you can even see muscle movement under the skin. Bob claimed his suit didn't have any padding, but it does seem to be awfully filled out for a human being, especially compared to Bob's body type. As mentioned previously, the inclusion of breasts is a strange addition since you never see that in any recreations to date. In fact, there is a good video of Bill Munns doing an in-depth presentation of Patty's physiology, including breast movement, with other tests, proving it wasn't a costume. I will provide a link to that in the description. I won't get into the walk or stride, as that is a back and forth battle of it being not humanly possible versus it being possible. Dr. Jeff Meldrum studied the film and was able to pick out finger movement. Why this is a big deal is that in both accounts of Philip Morris and Bob Hieronymus, they state that the arms were intentionally made longer than a human's and that, again the two offer differing views, Philip says sticks were used and Bob says the gloves were larger than his size. The hands in the film don't flop around like loose gloves and the fingers couldn't move if sticks were used. The main problem I have with the costume idea is that so much, dare I say, educated thought would have had to have been utilized when creating it that just a stock costume wouldn't fit the bill. Needless to say, to date we have yet to see a hoax video presented that shows the same thought put into the costume as we do here. Normally we see this, or this. However, there was an image caught in a trail cam that shows similar care, but has yet to be proven fake that I know of. Playing devil's advocate, I do need to mention a few things that do bother me to a degree. Frequently it is mentioned how Patty doesn't seem at all concerned at the sight of the two men, let alone, according to the story, the fact that she was surrounded. This is puzzling, but I can only wonder if she was possibly more accustomed to seeing people or since it was in 1967, the influx of visitors into the forest wasn't as great of a threat as it is today. I have found that many animals seem less concerned about humans when they are riding horses. I don't know if they don't associate it as a human riding an animal, rather, a rider and horse appear to be all one animal. Similar situations can be seen in a car, where you can drive right past the deer without them moving much, but yet, you normally can't walk even half as close to one. Another thing that bothers me is the whole aspect of this case revolving around money. Every player in this game was in it for making money, maybe excluding Bob Gimlin. I won't discredit this, as odd as it may seem, since even though Patterson wanted to gain fame off of it, it doesn't necessarily negate the fact that it could have been real. How many times have you heard people say, if you found Bigfoot, you would be rich? It seems to be a common idea held by society. Many people mention how coincidental it is that Patterson just happened to film a Bigfoot the moment he went looking for one. However, he previously went on many trips to find a Sasquatch but turned up no evidence. I personally looked into all sorts of reports debunking the footage, such as zippers being visible, an obvious waistband, and the like, but I couldn't find images that prove that. It amazes me that as of making this video, it has been 52 years since the video was first shot and we are still no closer to an answer than we were before. One tidbit to mention is that Bob Gimlin did later say that at the time he was certain it was real, but as time grew on he felt it may have been a hoax, but it would have had to have been carefully set up by Roger. This quote got me thinking. Many would assume he is outright saying it was a hoax, but in reality he is basically saying if it were a hoax, Roger would have had to have been the one behind it. Basically, he is covering his back as saying I had nothing to do with it if it is ever proven to be fake. Thinking about this, I couldn't help but think about the rule the two men agreed upon before their adventure, not to shoot it. I can't help but wonder if, hypothetically, this was purposely set up so Gimlin didn't shoot the actor that Patterson had previously staged in the area. While I think no one should shoot a Bigfoot, I do find the need for that rule being in place as an odd situation. 
So in light of all this information, I'm going to rule this as unsure. I personally believe it is a real video, but with this topic, it fluctuates so greatly in evidence for and against it that it would be totally biased to me to say it is 100% genuine. It isn't something like the famous Loch Ness photo, where it was deemed real until one guy stepped forward and said he faked it, and that is where it stands till this day. We had a guy step forward saying he was Patty, but then other information came out that derails that, so it makes it really tough. I also wanted to take a moment and mention that in my hashtag Ask Ben video, I messed up. I know, it is hard to believe, especially since I never mess up. In all seriousness, after uploading my video, I was alerted to the fact that I missed at least six of your questions. This is due to me simply doing a content search for hashtag Ask Ben, rather than manually searching my comment section for different variants of that term. I am planning on making a follow up video for that probably in the next couple weeks, if not in March. If you haven't yet done so, please consider subscribing to my channel for content like this, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would share my videos with someone you know who might enjoy this type of genre. With that, be safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Later!